Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another You Be The Behavior Consultant. Here we go, we got my audio going. And uh, thanks for hanging with us. We didn't have a live stream last week because I was attending the um, Animal Behavior Management Alliance and International Marine Animal Trainers Association Conference, which we'll talk about at the end here, but we want to get into our live stream. Oh, and Al says congratulations on a well-deserved win. Thank you, yes, one of my, my presentation won an award, which was very exciting. But I'm just so excited that the material was well-received, so that's that's, that's the really exciting news and that people were able to get that information. And you members, you guys are going to get that uh, course pretty soon. So um, keep an eye out for that. But let's get into our topic this week because I'm so excited about our, our live stream. Oh, and more congratulations coming in here. I appreciate it, everybody. Um, yeah, so um, hey, what are we doing here? We're doing another You Be the Behavior Consultant on um, a live stream I try to do most Mondays. As you guys know, last week we took the week off due to some travels but we are back and how it works is I present a topic for discussion I'm really excited about this week's topic I hope you guys are too um, and uh, I really hope that you will participate with your perspective experiences and ideas um, I have a few videos we'll look at and um, but I, I do have a lot of slides for this one but because there was just a lot to explore on this particular topic so heck, let's get into the topic. Um, our topic is exploring the metaphor of trust accounts in animal training. And um, this has been really, it was really fun to go down the rabbit hole, as they say, on this particular topic. Oh, and more congratulations. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll mention it at the end and what it was about and all that. Um, so uh, so we can get into that a little bit more. But, um, but yeah, so uh, some of you may have heard of this idea of a trust account and I'd love to hear what what your definition or what you may have heard as a definition for that and then I also kind of wanted to explore if um, if you feel like you've used a lot of positive reinforcement or maybe if you have you feel like you have trust with an animal but maybe if it if you still had like a challenge that that maybe it you know it, it didn't quite work out so well. Like maybe it couldn't, you know, that so-called trust was, it was still, um, I don't know, like there was still, still a behavior challenge that, that you felt like, well, I'm not quite getting there. I'm not quite succeeding. I'm not quite overcoming this situation, even though I really feel like this animal and I have a fantastic relationship, but I'm not getting to a resolution of a particular behavior goal. And maybe what your thoughts are on why it, it wasn't successful. I would love to hear like, what you think might be going on there. So I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you have any, any thoughts about this particular topic um, and, and, and any experiences with it or any ideas what a definition might be? <clears throat> Excuse me. Get recovering from all the travels here. It's a really fascinating topic. I, I will tell you, as I, as I started exploring, um, as I ex started exploring it a lot more, uh, I started actually before I left for the conference and then I kind of continued um, on the plane and then yesterday all day and I was just like, whoa, whoa, really, there's just, there was just a lot to um, unpack and, and it was really fun. Uh, maybe define trust first. That's a really good one, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'll let you guys give me some thoughts on what you think trust might be. Um, I did come up with sort of my my own def well I don't want to say my own definition I actually um I actually took some things from some other people as well that I I threw in there for maybe what might be a definition of trust but that's a really good point right um <laughs> yeah okay so Cynthia says got to got to change my avatar back yeah but I knew it was you um yes a burrow that I have huge trust with I thought but getting your comfy with hoof handling no yeah yeah I think that's a really great example um, and Jordan says to the second point, yes, yeah, that I, I have experienced this too, where I've, I've had this great relationship with an animal or I've, I've seen it with my clients. They seem like, you know, everything's going great, but then it's like, mm, you know, we'd go to try and do a procedure that's really, that they've had challenges with. And then 
it doesn't work out for whatever reasons. And I don't want to get too detailed, but I'll, I'll let you guys keep asking. Asking Trust is an honest communication between teacher and learner is a um, definition we've got from Sylvia. Trust is situational, I suppose. Mm, I think that's really in, um, insightful for sure. For sure. That's a good, good insight. Yeah. Yeah. Good observation there. I like that. Yeah, that, that's that's a, a really good point. Yeah, so, I, you know, like I think an example that um, really comes up for me, and I'll share a video that you might appreciate in a bit here, is um, like sometimes when I'm working with clients, we'll, we'll have animals that are doing great in their training sessions or doing all their behaviors, and then um, they'll say, can you help us with this injection training? Um, we seem to have a lot of challenges getting the animal to be comfortable with injection training or blood draws. And that's when we see the animal start going, oh, I don't want to participate, right? Um, and we start seeing the animal pull away or not leaving their, their body in the position we need for that. And that kind of sounds like what Cynthia was describing about with the hoof handling, perhaps. And that maybe ties into what Chris is saying about trust is situational. Does that make some sense for some people? Or does that kind of bring up some um, thoughts about maybe things that you might have experienced? <laughs> it's getting, getting our wheels turning a little bit on this, on this topic. And I think this is what had me thinking, you know, what started me going on. Um, that's why I don't think there is an overall trust account. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not so much of if I have a lot of this, it, over, it will compensate for that. And so maybe ties in with your comment about it's situational. Um, does it seem that when an animal has an opinion about something, changing their mind may not be given, especially if aversive? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it kind of makes you want to think a little bit more about what does it take to um, change that situation uh, when there's an aversive stimulus in the environment. I think that's kind of, you know, I'm putting words in your mouth, Patricia, <laughs> I think, but that maybe that's where you're going. Um, and trust could go two ways. Do we trust the animal, right? Yeah, absolutely, right. <laughs> some are some are big and um, potentially, you know, could could hurt us. Uh, absolutely, and I think we especially see that in situations where you know maybe an animal has had a bad experience with a person, and so they may show some aggressive responses to try and drive us away. Um, trusting experiences, um, Al says, you know, what are maybe help. Help, help describe what some of those trusting experiences might be, volatiles, which are adding there. Yeah, I think so. Again, aggressive responses from the animal to drive us away. Um, Jordan says, agree, it may be situational, past experiences, so positive or negative, run beat, or deep. So what are those, um, you know, maybe those reinforcement histories, maybe both positive and negative reinforcement histories. Yeah. Um, I think I lose trust for a given procedure if I push past a fear threshold even a tiny bit. Really good observation. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I think that's a, another really good observation. Well, you guys are coming up with really great relevant stuff that um, actually ties in with a number of things that I have on some of the slides coming up here or other circumstances that are impacting their motivation. Um, so maybe shifting weather can also impact an animal's willingness to shift. So that actually ties in really well with the presentation I gave at the conference <laughs> when I was talking about nonlinear um, contingency analysis, that there can be other factors that are um, impacting the animal's participation or the, their, their, um, the behavior that we want that don't necessarily have to do with the maybe the food reinforcer or whatever reinforcer we're, we're um, uh, offering at that time, it, that there could be these other uh, contingencies. So that's a good observation as well. You guys are coming up with great stuff here. I love it. Ah, you're so good. Hi, we have such a good group here <laughs> that participate in these things. Well, I think um, since you guys are really on a great path here, I think what I might do is go ahead and provide a few definitions that I found and then maybe we'll go into a little deeper dive about um, 
what I found, at least in terms of origins for this information. And, um, and there may be some other out there, but this is what I could find. So I don't want to say that, you know, what I found is the be all end all, but this is the best that I could find. So first, I'm going to share with you the oldest definition I could find. And, um, and I'm sorry if I'm going to read off of here, but I want to be accurate. <laughs> but this, um, oh, and let me read from Patricia. With horses, we give a lot of weight to the weather and its impact on the horse behavior da daily. Yeah, I think that's completely valid. I think there are, are multiple contingencies that impact the behaviors we observe. So I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. So this definition I um, am taking from Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits um, of Highly Effective People, and it was first published in 1989. So that's 34 years ago. So this goes um, pretty far back. And um, he called it an emotional trust account or emotional bank account, I should say. An emotional bank account is a metaphor that describes the amount of trust that has been built up in a relationship. It's the feeling of safeness you have with another human being. If I make deposits into an emotional bank account with you through courtesy, kindness, honesty, and keeping my commitments to you, I build up a reserve. Your trust toward me becomes higher and I can call upon that trust many times if I need to. I can even make mistakes and that trust level, that emotional reserve will compensate for it. When the trust account is high, communication is easy, instant, and effective. But if I have a habit of showing discourtesy, disrespect, cutting you off, overreacting, ignoring you, becoming arbitrary, betraying your trust, threatening you, or playing a little tin god in your life, eventually my emotional bank account is overdrawn. The trust level gets very low. And it's been republished, so I gave the reference to the most recent publication. Um, and so uh, so that's that's the first time I could find this in, in print anywhere. And then um, this is a, another kind of more succinct summary of that, um, someone who is kind of summarizing um, Covey's uh, description of an emotional bank account. And her version was, an emotional bank account is a system of emotional deposits and withdrawals that helps build relationships. You have an emotional bank account in every relationship that's unique. And by making deposits or acts of kindness and love, you strengthen it. Acts of cruelty or betrayal are withdrawals and weaken the relationship. You want to ensure you have a positive balance in these emotional bank accounts. If you have built up a large reserve, the other person will likely give you more grace and forgiveness when you have to make a withdrawal. However, if you have a very low balance or are overdrawn, you have little room for another withdrawal. And she was kind of summarizing um, the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, and, um, and if you're not familiar with that book, it's, it's kind of like a self-help book uh, that was sort of tar targeted towards leaders in the business world. Uh, so just to give you a little, you know, background on that. And then um, another definition that is more targeted towards animal trainers, uh, this was from 2010, was, this is a summary from a lecture um, that somebody was watching. And it says, a trust account is like a bank account. When we're training with positive reinforcement or doing things the, animals, the animal likes, we're making deposits into that trust account. When we're using aversives and punishers or doing things the animal doesn't like, we're making withdrawals from that trust account. If we have a large positive balance in our trust account, we're going to have willing, eager, eager animals that want to be around us. So what I thought we'd try to do um, is explore where did this metaphor come from and is it empirically based? So I think who we really need to go back to is this guy, who was Stephen Covey? And, and, uh, and where, you know, did this metaphor come from? And, I, and, you know, and you know, how did he come to use this metaphor? Because I really kind of think this is the guy who who came up with it and, and first, um, you know, disseminated this, this, uh, this uh, metaphor. So Stephen Covey was um, heavily influenced by Peter Drucker, who was this German business consultant advisor who was highly influential in the business world, but also by Carl Rogers. And this is kind of where we really need to investigate. So Carl Rogers was a humanistic psychologist, and we're going to take a look at the humanistic approach to um, psychology. So this is where we're really going to have some fun. So, um, 
And another key influence on his thinking was his study of American self-help I can't say it, self-help books that he did for his doctoral dissertation. So I think that's important for us to recognize that self-help books are kind of, you know, his his niche. And, and, and further influence on Covey was his affiliation with the Latter-day Saints Church. Um, according to Clayton Christensen, I, I'm having a hard time today, Christensen, The Seven Habits was a secular distillation of Latter-day Saint values. Covey was a professor at the Marriott School of Management at BYU for several years, helping to establish the Masters of Organizational Behavior Program, which has since been merged into the MBA program. While at BYU, Covey served as an assistant to the university president. He was a professor at the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University at the time of his death. So um, so I, I would say that, you know, what we're looking at is stuff that, you know, really kind of came from the, the um, you know, his, his work as kind of a leader in the business world, um, maybe some influences from his Latter-day Saints Church, um, self-help books. But I think what we really need to look at is this humanistic psychology school of thought. So what is that? So where did that come from? So I think this is really important stuff for us. So what is the humanistic approach to psychology? So the humanistic approach has the perspective that people have free will, that you have control over your own life. And, um, and the goal is what's known as self-actualization. And uh, this is the desire to reach your full potential. And, and they believe that it's innate to be goal oriented, that you know, you're always striving to meet these goals and that people are inherently good and are self-motivated to be good. Um, another um, prominent name is um, Maslow, if I said it correctly, and he developed this hierarchy of needs, which you'll see here in this chart here. And so you need to meet these um, hierarchy of needs from the bottom up in order to actually achieve self-actualization. And, um, and sort of, you know, one of the things that I read about it said that very few actually re achieve self-actualization, that it's supposedly very hard to attain. Uh, and that growth promoting climates nurture self actualization. And so that means, you know, what that meant was that, you know, you need like the way their parents brought you up, like, did they give you unconditional love? If they didn't give you unconditional love, that it would be sort of difficult to, to achieve self actualization. Um, it's really important to have self acceptance. Your self image needs to match your self. Um, your ideal self, they called it got congruence in order for you to have um, a good self-esteem, uh, which is important for you to achieve that self-actualization. Um, in the world of psychology, it's sort of considered not so much a discipline like um, behaviorism, which is Skinner and Pavlov and all that, but more of a practice, sort of an, an approach, not so much um, a, a scientific field. So, um, so there are some criticisms with this approach to looking at psychology. And these are some of the major criticisms that the concepts are kind of vague and they're kind of subjective. They're not really, you're, you're not really able to objectify, you know, what is self-actualization? What is self-esteem? What is um, your ideal self? What is your, you know, your self-image? So you can't really test those things. And since conclusions are drawn from these subjective experience, it's almost impossible to verify, making it really kind of hard to do research and have reliable research in that field. And, and so because of that, um, critics claim that it's not really a true science because there's not all this, um, there's not objectivity. It's kind of people doing self-reports about things as opposed to being able to measure behavior and, um, and compare that. Um, the therapy is a little bit more like people listening, kind of like a friend, trying to be very empathetic and focusing on building self-esteem, um, not, not trying to do like a measurable intervention that you can compare and repeat over and over again. And, um, and then the real question comes for those of us in the animal training world, how does this apply to um, uh, non-human learners, so like our animals? So those are some of the major criticism criticism. I can't say it, criticisms of it. Um, but for those that, you know, like it, there it's kind of, you know, the approach is meant to be like really positive in the sense that it's like building you up and making you feel better, um, really focusing on, you know, 
like, you know, I, I'm, I'm here to support you. I'm here with you. You know, we're going to get there and, you know, you're a good person and, and, um, and trying to focus on that, not that there's a problem with you, but you are great and you are good and we're going to, and you're going to be better, better, better. Um, and it's actually still really pre- prevalent um, in, in human therapy. So it's, it's not, it's not, you know, obsolete or anything like that. So one of the things that we've talked about before in our live streams is that is about mentalism. And that is that study of behavior that we assume comes from some inner dimension. And this is very um, different from, um, you know, deterministic or behaviorism um, that we that we tend to come from. So the dimension, uh, the dimension is, um, ter- you know, so we think about things like neural, psychic, spiritual, subjective, um, um, hypothetical things. So, you know, we talked about hypothetical constructs and explanatory fictions before in one of our live streams. And so those are all mentalistic approaches. And so this, the humanistic approach kind of falls under that category of mentalis- mentalistic or mentalism. And let's see what else. These phenomena are typically designated to some sort of act, state, mechanism, process that um, that is causal um, in terms of initiating or, or causing the problem. So it's kind of coming from within. Uh, let's see what else. Um, I don't know if I need to read all these. But again, you know, the hypothetical constructs and explanatory fictions are the stock and trade of mentalism, which has kind of dominated Western intellectual thought and most psychological theories. So there are many psychological models that fall under this um, this category. And so the humanistic approach kind of comes um, under that category. So what about behaviorism? Ooh, I'm going to make that a little bit smaller. So behaviorism is really where behavior analysis and experimental analysis of behavior falls under. So this is where we go. Behavior is lawful and controlled by the environment and environmental events occurring under close temporal relation to the behavior. So this is, you know, your operant conditioning, your classical conditioning. And we tend to take that approach that we're using that, that the idea that behavior is selected by things that happen in the environment. And we also use that in conjunction with the ethology and the phylogeny of the organism. And the reason I put this photo in here is because at this recent conference, um, there was a really fascinating paper that was presented by one of the um, uh, delegates about African elephants and well, and Asian elephants too, I take that um, back, it's both elephants, learning how to take down electrified fences by using their tusks and their toenails to test, because those don't conduct electricity. Yes, Aaron Ivory, Aaron Ivory thanks, Anetta. Um, by using their tusks and their toenails to, to, because they don't conduct electricity, to test you know, where they can touch the fence to take down the electric fence um, so that they can get access to areas where they, you know, want to go forage. forage. And, you know, I think that was just, you know, again, it was just such a great example of, you know, learning, um, operant learning, you know, from the environment uh, to, you know, use your behavior to get what you want. And, um, and of course, the sad part of it is, as she was pointing out in her presentation, was that it was creating these, quote, super elephants that can figure out any problem to to get into these areas where, you know, people don't want elephants to be. And it's creating conflict between the, the elephants and the population, and which ends up being bad news for both the humans and the elephants, because then the elephants become nuisance elephants. But but um, but again, to me, it was you know, just that great example of, of how this science of, of um, you know, what we know about how behavior is lawful and controlled by the environment. And, and it's exactly how, you know, what we know about the experimental analysis of behavior and how it works to, to change behavior of animals. So again, you know, this kind of approach is based on well-defined and studied behavior principles. Um, and what, what, uh, behaviors does is they use um, precise description of procedures. You know, so we we try to write 
sort of a shaping plan. It may be a shaping plan, but it also may use a variety of those principles to get to your objective, uh, your your goal, but it's not subjective or based on philosophies. We try to be very precise. Um, behavior is observable and measurable, making it testable. Therefore, principles and procedures have been empirically tested in the field and the lab, which makes uh, this science the most scientific of the science, uh, psychological sciences. And the focus is on behavior, rejection of hypothetical underlying causes of behavior. And then there's also radical behaviorism, which we never we haven't even talked about in these live streams, which includes covert behaviors such as private thoughts and emotions. And of course, if you watch the GOATS presentation by uh, Anna Linehan, she talks about how um, emotions relate to contingencies. So we kind of we kind of get that in there. So, so this is um, a, a different school of thought. And in fact, the humanistic um, approach kind of rose as a way to kind of push back on behaviorism, which is really fascinating <laughs> when you look at those two things, because they felt that this was too rigid, whereas the humanistic part wanted to kind of bring, bring back a little bit more, you know, focus on the person and more of a holistic approach as opposed to be, being more reductionist. So it's really interesting when you look at that stuff. Um, and Chris says, a new elephant cu culture, can they figure out beehives? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I bet they can. <laughs> So, um, so it's really interesting to see how these different schools of thought are coming at, at things from different um, perspectives. So what I tried to do, you know, thinking that, okay, so Stephen Covey is pulling from the humanistic approach to come up with this uh, way of saying, well, you know, it's really important to, you know, build trusting relationships where, where I can see, I, I get that, you know, we, we want to have these good relationships with our animals, but now... Could we take what we know about behaviorism, which is a very, um, you know, scientific psychological science, and now put this trust account through that lens and do a little bit more explanation or, you know, ex exploration of that and see if we can help understand what might be going on there? Because I think some of the things you guys mentioned are really, really important. Like you mentioned that sometimes we still have challenges. Like we feel like we've got a great relationship with this animal, but it didn't overcome the fact that the animal's going, oh, wait a minute, I don't like that. And I, and I think I'm, I'm gonna share a video with you um, from this recent conference. We watched this really fantastic training session with um, a gorilla. And I would say that this person has a fantastic relationship. She has a wonderful relationship with this gorilla. But I want you to see if you can notice um, uh, a couple things, or well, really one thing that this animal responds to where he says, oh, I'm not into that. And, and I would say it has nothing to do with trust. I think she has a great relationship with the animal. But there's something going on there that, that it isn't about trust. And let's see if you guys can notice it. So I'm just going to play the video. All right. So all of our, our training professionals up here know exactly what that is. No explanation needed, I'm sure. Uh, for those of you in the back, um, or if you're just visiting the zoo as visitors, again, welcome to Zoo Atlanta. But that clicker, we call it a bridge. And that just tells Taz right at that moment that that's what I wanted you to do, right at that moment. Because it takes some time from the time that we give him a piece of food and the time that he does the behavior that we want. And so we don't want any confusion that, that would occur within that time. So that bridge instantaneously tells him, that's what I did right, so that he'll do it the next time. Um, so yeah, our training program, with all of our gorillas are involved in our training programs, uh, along with almost all of our animals here at Zoo Atlanta. Um, and yeah, right now you're seeing a lot of body presentation from Taz. So ears, fingers, toes, chest, shoulder, thigh. It allows us to get a full physical checkup on him whenever we want. Um, so if you were to ever get an injury, or any of these guys were ever to get an injury, say, uh, you know, we got a lot of we got a lot of little little kids in here, little brothers and sisters. You think little brothers and sisters fight every once in a while? <laughs> yep. So if they were to get in a scuffle and someone gets an injury, we can have them show us that injury rather than you know if we feel it's serious enough and we just can't get a good look at it, we might have to sedate them in order to get, check those injuries out. So having them show us that injury is going to be a lot less stressful, a lot more safe than having to do a sedation. <laughs> um, 
So like I said, uh, a lot of these are body presentation right now, but we will actually build on those body presentation behaviors as well. So shoulder, for example, right there. Uh, she just asked for his shoulder. I don't know if she's going to actually do. Uh, oh, she looks like she's just working her way up to an actual uh, blunted or maybe a maybe a cap needle uh, poke. But we'll use that shoulder presentation for injections. All of our gorillas get the flu vaccine every year. They all received their COVID vaccines last year. Um, so. You know, all these behaviors that we're training with our animals help us take better care of them. And we call them husbandry behaviors. So anything that's helping us take better care of our animals um, is, is a husbandry behavior. Uh, we do focus on some, some other behaviors as well, like chess, you know, Floyd's over there just handing it up, trying to, <laughs> trying to steal, the, steal the show, for sure. That's what he does best. Um, we do some other behaviors too, like chess beat. Um, and that's an educational behavior. You know, we can talk about a chest beat. What does that chest beat mean when, you know, an adult silverback is doing it versus a three-year-old uh, little little punk over there? What's he do? What does he mean when he's chest beating? So, um, we do train behavior a lot more frequently. So they they all know who she is now, um, and we get voluntary echocardiograms on pretty much all of our gorillas, um, which is is important. Um, heart health is actually a, a big issue with, with great apes. Um, it's the leading cause of mortality for a number of great ape species as adults. So we really focus on heart health. So um, like I said, echocardiograms. Um, some gorillas, can, we can get um, voluntary blood pressure readings. Some gorillas were able to draw blood voluntarily on. Um, so we actually take this information and we're creating baseline data on what is normal gorilla heart function. So then when we do get a, an echocardiogram that is off, all right, now we can make some, make some adjustments based off of legitimate baseline gorilla heart function. Um, in the past, we've been basing a lot of what we do on human heart function, and we want to make sure we're basing it off of gorilla heart function. So, uh, And as you can see, he's holding a lot longer now. And we do a continuous reinforcement while we do, while he does it. Oh, he's, he's a little like, what's going on right now? But when we do this, we do a continuous reinforcement just to make sure he doesn't go after that probe. It's a it's a thirty thousand dollar probe. It's insured, but it's still a five thousand dollar probe insured. So, um, are there any questions right now? I've been rambling, but all right, we've got a couple. Go ahead. So I'm going to turn the audio down and let that play again so we can talk about it a little bit. So what, what are your guys' thoughts? Do you think there's not enough positive reinforcement there? Do you think that the person has issues with their relationship? What, what is it you, that you noticed? Or what was the challenge? Did you did you notice anything challenging? Any any comments? <laughs> Those crossed arms of not today, lady. Yeah, yeah, you you did notice. Uh, and yeah, there were other individuals affecting behavior. <laughs> Annette is going to be quiet because she knows that she and I discussed the issues. Or, or the, the main issue. There's one, one thing that really stands out for me of um, uh, needles can be scary. Yes. Yeah, Jordan saw it. Yeah, so there, um, and, and you may notice it as things get going here. Um, yes, challenge was the syringe. Yeah, so so it's going to be coming up here soon. I, I put a long leader of uh, lots of um, of behaviors that the gorilla was responding to very quickly and you know with great cooperation because I wanted to demonstrate that he was very happy to participate um, but his behavior changes when she picks up the syringe uh, so hopefully you can see yeah so here it comes you know watch how he he isn't quite as willing to do what he's supposed to do or what she asks when she's holding that syringe. 
Um, definitely seems to have um, arm behaviors established, but saw the trainer adjust criteria to having the syringe on the sill. Yeah, so she she has to do a few adjust, adjustments when the syringe is in, um, um, involved. So that tells us that um, something about about the the syringe, and I I don't and so you know to me stimulus conditions changed. It's not that the trainer's relationship is a problem or that there isn't enough positive reinforcement going on or that if she only had more positive reinforcement that that would change what's going on with the syringe to me what i see is that there's now an aversive stimulus in the environment that's impacting you know that Partic- you know, what she's requesting, the specific behavior she's requesting, right? So that gives us some information. And, and I think what's really important, and I, the reason I left in the part where she picks up the, um, the object she's going to use to touch his chest is because I wanted to show that it's, it's not just about objects. It's about that specific object. It's about the syringe versus, you know, the other object he's okay with. And again, you know, if you if you were just to say she doesn't have enough positive reinforcement or trust account, I would I would have I would take issue with that. I think that she has a lot of positive reinforcement going on here. Um, so it's not it's not that. We can break this down into a lot more detail to explain what's going on with that syringe. And we will momentarily. I just want to give you another chance to uh, see how he's very compliant when she brings up the um, device that she's going to use for the cardiac care. And yes, you're right. The, 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 the young ones are also an aversive stimulus to him because he tries to drive them away, doesn't he? He wants distance from the the young ones, and he also wants distance from the syringe. Okay, so let's go. Um, let's talk about this now. So what's what's going on here? So now, if we take this idea of the trust account, and and after looking at that video. And we look at this metaphor with a behaviorist lens, um, we might be able to look at that, what video we just looked at there, and see what, why just piling on more positive reinforcement is a challenge. Um, what's really going on is superimposition, right? And we may, we've kind of talked about this term a little bit in the past. We've basically got competing contingencies. We've got a positive reinforcement contingency superimposed over a negative reinforcement contingency. We're just saying that, well, here's the positive reinforcement. You can have some food, but there's also a negative reinforcement contingency. The animal wants to avoid that aversive stimulus. And so just piling on the positive reinforcement doesn't really eliminate the negative reinforcement. And so that's why we've got this conflict and this hesitation and it doesn't really take care of that negative reinforcement contingency. It's still there. The animal still wants to move away from the aversive stimulus. So what really has to happen is that um, the animal needs to learn what it needs to do to get that aversive stimulus to go away. And in this, or we just remove the aversive stimulus and the animal will come back and participate just fine, which is what we saw, right? So if she took the aversive stimulus away, that gorilla's right back in there going, fine, I'll do whatever you want, no problem. Um, or in this case, because we do need the gorilla to eventually be comfortable with that syringe, 
then what she really needs to do is use distance as a reinforcer to teach the animal what's the right thing to do. So, um, and we have talked about this before, um, and we also have that upcoming behavior challenge, which will teach you how to do that if you're not 100% sure how to do that. But we have to address that negative reinforcement contingency. Just piling positive reinforcement on top of it, will it'll always be competing. So the moment that that, you know, so the animal's always going to be doing that hesitation thing um, because the animal knows that that's what it needs to do, just move away. You know, I got to get away from it. And the idea of exposure therapies, which we've talked about before, where you're bringing it closer and um, the fear response has to extinguish and maybe you're using food to try and help extinguish that fear response, bringing it closer, bringing it closer, bringing it closer. You're just putting pressure on the animal and waiting for that fear response to extinguish. The problem with that is that um, all it takes is the right stimulus conditions and that fear response will spontaneously recover. Um, so let's say, you know, now it's time for a real injection and the veterinarian shows up with the syringe and the medication and the animal's going to go, oh, I know what this is about. And that fear response is right back there. So the counter conditioning systematic desensitization approach doesn't really help you either. So that's why we really want to address the negative reinforcement contingency. So this is why that trust account metaphor doesn't really help you in those situations. We have to narrow our focus in on the actual negative reinforcement condition um, uh, contingency and address it. Um, we just can't pile positive reinforcement on top of it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, and it is said she could have used the crossed arms behavior for another degree of um, behavior bef um, um, if she had reinforced it uh, off topic. So sorry. Um, yeah. So she's also saying that, you know, the animal could have another behavior that says, I don't want to do this. And that gets reinforced. Um, so so that's another option, too. So you all can listen to Sean and Masa's uh, great presentation on degrees of freedom that we did for goats as well. So um, so this is really what's going on with the idea of, you know, how much trust is in your trust account, you know, so did you put in a lot of positive reinforcement and did you not have a lot of um, aversives going on, that it, it just won't actually address the negative reinforcement contingency unless you just had no negative reinforcement contingencies. But if you do have a negative reinforcement contingency, um, all the positive reinforcement in the world isn't going to get rid of the negative reinforcement contingency. You actually have to eliminate the negative reinforcement contingencies either by removing the aversive or teaching the animal what to do by using that distance as a reinforcer, by using that negative reinforcement contingency. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it as best I can there. So going back to um, what Chris said at the top, um, about operationalizing trust. So how I might operationalize it is we could talk about affiliative behaviors. So affiliative behaviors are social interactions that function to reinforce social bonds between individuals or a group which are of mutual benefit to all animals involved. So not just the, the um, one we're training, but also the person who, on the other end. Um, but these are going to differ, right? They're going to differ depending on the species and the reinforcement history. So, um, so that helps us have a little bit more individualization to it all, I think. Um, so that's why I chose those words. And then this is a quote that I heard at the conference that I really liked. Um, I liked that Linda Erb from the Dolphin Research Center said, trust is the absence of fear. And I liked that. Um, and, uh, and then when you go back to our GOATS presentation from uh, Anna Linaham, if we were to look at fear as an outcome of contingencies, um, fear is the absence of a negative reinforcement contingency, a distance in response to the, to the aversive stimulus. So, um, so that goes back to what I was just saying, that we would have to get rid of that negative reinforcement contingency, which means, you know, that, you know, it's always, so we have to get rid of superimposition. So it's always lurking underneath, waiting for the right stimulus contingencies to evoke that behavior that we describe as fear responses. And remember, it can, o it can also occur under new conditions. So, you know, new stimulus conditions, you know, if 
be something is going on at the end. Was like, oh, I don't know what this is about. And then suddenly that fear response is occurring. So you have to look for those negative reinforcement contingencies. Is there aversive stimulus, stimuli? Is the animal trying to escape or avoid that? You've got a negative reinforcement contingency going on and you need to address it. You can't just pile on the positive reinforcement. So, um, so we'll, I want to talk about solutions, but then I also want to show you another video too. Um, so again, this goes back to our solutions are to I identify those negative reinforcement contingencies. Avoiding superimposition, we can't just pile positive reinforcement on top of negative reinforcement. And we have to address the negative reinforcement contingency so positive reinforcement can have its, its intended effect. Either remove the aversive uh, conditions or shape for the desired response using distance as a reinforcer if the aversive stimulus conditions must be present. So like if you're, you have to do an injection or you, um, you know, you're going to do restraint, something like that. So I want to go back to the question that everybody asks, should you be present for an aversive event? And the answer is not whether you have a big trust account. We just saw that with the gorilla. <laughs> that doesn't matter, right? Um, the answer is about the stimulus conditions, right? So how aversive is the anticipated event? Do you want to be associated with a, an, an event that's going to be so aversive and maybe be something that the animal is going to remember for a long time because it was so aversive. You know, we have that, you know, that one trial learning where, you know, you learn to avoid that stimulus conditions for the rest of your life because it was so aversive. Think about like, um, for me, I, I gave this example in one of our um, live streams where I used some soap that gave me hives all over my body. And so now I bring my own soap with me wherever I go, you know, so so I avoid, you know, any kind of, you know, soap in a hotel, I never use their soap. I always avoid their soap. I use my own soap. So you, you want to think about how aversive will that event be. Um, and then the other thing to think about is where this event's going to occur. How different are those stimulus conditions? Remember the environment, those stimulus conditions become part of the experience so um are you know where if you're going to be involved will you ever be in that environment again where this aversive thing is going to happen or are all your interactions with the animal going to be in other places so so you're you know so you do you anticipate most of your interactions occur with that animal in other places where most of those interactions do not involve aversive stimuli and is this event that's going to happen you know is it not going to be that aversive and is it going to happen in a place that you never are ever in hardly ever at all so the that's it's unlikely that that's going to have a big lasting impact and the other question is how frequently is this going to happen you know is it very rare or is it going to be happening over and over and over again so it's going to have more and more impact so those are things that i would be thinking about so let's look at a video that um I think might help illustrate some of this. So this was a sheep that, you know, the farrier was there and they wanted to work on her hooves. Um, and you're gonna see the conditions are pretty different, even though it was, you know, near to where she lives, the number of people involved in the restraint procedure, um, there was food, you know, and you'll see that the person that's giving her food is somebody that she trains with on a regular basis, but the conditions in which the restraint was happening for the hoof tr trimming is very different from the conditions in which the training occurs. And the, the training session you'll see happened after the restraint, not the same day, but the next day. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. 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 
Cooking and curling. Okay. Mm -hmm. nope. You're not being. You got a trickle with you too. It. So to answer um, Cynthia's question, do you have to stop the positive reinforcement temporarily if you go to negative reinforcement for a solution like this with an animal who has been used to positive reinforcement all the time? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's kind of what we were showing in that video there that, you know, initially when they were restraining the sheep, they weren't giving them any food. And I just said, hey, why don't we give them some food at least? You know, so that was counter conditioning in that situation. Um, and, uh, and, and then, uh, and that, that did, you know, at least kind of take a little bit of, you know, the unpleasantness out of the situation. And then the next day, you know, they just, uh, they just tried, you know, seeing if the sheep would cooperate and, you know, for some training, cause I, I was there on site and, and they still participated. So, so, um, so yeah, so hopefully that helps give you a little, a little idea of what we're talking about there. So I'm, I'm hoping some of this is making sense there. All right. Um, so with that, <laughs> I, I am going to lead us into the recap here, unless you guys have some more, more comments on this, because I do have a bunch of announcements for you. So what I, what I want to kind of say about all this stuff is that, you know, I, I don't think, you know, like anybody was, you know, trying to do anything wrong by, by giving this idea about the trust account. I think it, you know, was actually, you know, it, it was kind of like, you know, it's, it's a nice idea. It's, it's a, it's a easy to understand solution. But I think the reality is that, you know, behavior doesn't really occur like, like that on a one-to-one -one ratio. If I give a lot of good stuff, it'll counteract the bad stuff. Um, if it were that easy, all our behavior problems would be solved, right? And, you know, as we have been observing, we often see that animals may still withdraw their arms when they see a syringe. They may still stretch their necks to avoid shoots. They may still walk around and avoid slippery scales. They may still avoid the veterinarian and they may still try to hurt or drive people away. They view threatening no matter how many appetitives we offer. Um, we are really super fortunate that we can look to the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis to help us think critically about metaphors that sound like easy, easy solutions to what are in reality a bit more complex behavior challenges. But what we can learn from these self-help style resources is that so many communities are in search of a better way to influence behavior, uh, and you know, which is awesome, right? We're all just looking for nicer ways to do things, and I think that's fantastic. So, but I, but I do think, you know, as special specialists in the field of behavior change, especially with animals, it's really important for us to investigate resources for their origin, for their validity, for their effectiveness, and for their ability to improve welfare, um, it's part of our responsibility to protect the welfare of our learners. So while there are many benefits to positively reinforcing behavior, we must also identify and address the negative reinforcement contingencies to optimize welfare. Yes. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, with sheep, would you say the bank account was full with a little withdrawal? I don't think it's about... Um, you know, bank accounts at all. I just think it's about um, identifying contingencies, you know, because if we, if we, you know, look at it as bank accounts, then we're looking at superimposition. So we have to really narrow it down to identifying the contingencies and address the specific contingencies. So I just don't even think of it as a bank account. Yeah. <laughs> um, and to, you know, to help us, uh, you know, like explore a few things a little bit more, I think, which, you know, will help you see it as stimulus conditions and and also contingencies um, and, and maybe avoid some of the constructs is we do have the live streams as on the hypothetical constructs and this gets a little bit more into the mentalism um, definitions. And then the helping animals remember or forget really looks at the stimulus conditions. And so that, that will help us a little bit. And then also that fear challenge that's coming up on April 2nd, that is what's going to help you identify those negative reinforcement contingencies and then give you the step-by-step -step process of how to, um, how to shape, you know, like that gorilla, what to do to help that gorilla be comfortable with the syringe. And so, so that's, that's what that's all about. So if you haven't registered for that, just go to behaviorchallenge.com and that will um, get you set up on that. That starts in a couple weeks. And, uh, and then you guys have all been mentioning the, the um, award. So I will just mention what that was about. It I was, you know, 
like completely surprised and um, and very grateful. But at the um, Animal Behavior Management Alliance Conference, uh, it, joint conference with International Marine uh, Animal Trainers Association, the that presentation there won a um, a Welfare Advancement Award, which is really uh, like so cool because like, as mentioned in the presentation this is information that comes from Israel Gold Diamond's work and um, disseminated in the book um, Nonlinear Contingency Analysis from uh, Joe Lang et al and all I really did was try to share how we could apply that information to animal training to basically do what we talked about today, which is identify contingencies so that we're better able to avoid superimposition and identify that negative reinforcement contingency so we can address it so that positive reinforcement can have its effect. So, um, so I'm really pleased that that got that attention so that, so that um, hopefully we can continue to improve animal welfare. So really excited for that. And we'll make sure that you guys have access to that um, course soon. I just have to make a recording for you all. And thank you for all the kind words. Congratulations. And Pat, Patricia says she read the book and loved it. I'm glad to hear that. And Kristen says, way to crush it, Barb, and push the envelope. But but you did it so well, Susanetta. That's very nice. And I also want to make sure you guys know that this amazing resource is available to you now. Look at this. Look at this. This just These were just released. Um, so, you know, special shout out to Annetta Peterson here. She's the chair of the Animal Training Working Group for EASA. And um, our team has been working on these for quite a while now and really pleased to announce that they are available to you now. They are free to download. Just go to EASATrainingGuidelines.com. It's about a 60 page document, but it's really easy to release or read. Sorry. <laughs> really easy to read. There's lots of graphics and pictures and um, whatnot. And, um, and just go to that. URL and you can download that for free and we're really proud of them and we hope they will help you and where wherever you are in your training program and please uh, please download them so go to eazatrainingguidelines.com and get your copy and um, and they're they're a living document so they will grow and evolve um, with time but this is the first version so check it out um, and uh, Christina says congratulations and thank you for a great presentation good work Annetta this publication is super um, thank you so much I'm glad you guys are checking it out and please you know tell other, tell others we want people to use this resource and for those of you that took the um, behavior challenge uh, oh and Annetta says Barbara had a huge part in this to say the least and those of you that took the behavior challenge oh my god I have to show you this adorable video of one of our participants Quinn and trainer Emma check this out isn't that adorable our open mouth behavior challenge this is um, <laughs> we had uh, we had over 25 different species participating um, but this is just such an adorable video and and of course this was training animals to um, yeah. to do this open mouth behavior with this particular shaping plan and we had oh my god we had bush dogs and Netta had uh, her monitor monitor lizards from Copenhagen Zoo doing it we had capybara we had uh, porcupines we had a um, uh, tapir so many cool animals but um, but those of you that um, are in there we're going to do a behind the scenes tour at animaltrainingfundamentals.com you should have got an email that's going to be tomorrow so if you want to see what's in the program um, if you might want to become a member and participate in um, all the cool things we've got going at animaltrainingfundamentals.com be sure to uh, attend that tomorrow and then next week we have our our training cockroaches goats presentation um Oh, yeah, that was a cool example of a non-food reinforcer with Quinn, yeah. And then she also did use food, too, so she could do it two ways. But, yes, next week, guys, I can't believe this one's already here, but we're doing another GOATS presentation with Chris, Var Chris Varnon on uh, training cockroaches. We are just doing some cool stuff, man. So you all have to... Um, Y'all have to come for that one. So remember, go to atfgoats.com um, and uh, register for that, or just send me an email if you're a member, and we'll get you get you on the list. And we do have the replay available for Anna's um, emotions um, presentation if you have missed that one. And again, we have a citation for this uh, particular presentation on trust accounts if you need that. And if you're not yet a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. Look at we got so much cool stuff going on. So please come join us. 
And there you go. And there's the award if you haven't seen it. Woohoo. <laughs> okay, look at that. I can't believe I ended on time. I thought there was going to be so much uh, stuff on this particular topic because I had so many slides in here, but uh, we're just on time. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this topic. It was really fun to uh, explore and, uh, and learn about another little kind of side area of uh, psychology and uh, and yeah and really really fun to explore so I'm um, so glad you guys were here and enjoying enjoying these live streams and uh, and be sure to join us next week for the for the um, cockroach training one <gasps> so cool our goats presentation okay guys uh, I think we'll wrap it up and uh, get working on uh, recording the um, nonlinear nonlinear contingency analysis presentation, so you all can enjoy that. All right. So Inez says, "Love this. Thank you again for a great money or mon money Monday, <laughs> and thank you from uh, so many of you. So thanks again, you guys. I really appreciate you being here and um, and uh, learning with me. Okay. All right, you guys. We'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>